I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, we, uh, Jason, we're in kind of that period. It's I call it the the dead zone, like the Super Bowl ends. So you've been watching football and from a sports from a view. sports perspective, and you just kind of I'm trying to to like get excited about college basketball, but but really it's hard to get excited about it and. And then, well, really, because you're an LSU fan, well, <laughs> we're right at 500, which which they have made an improvement. I mean, yeah, last two or three years were rough in that round, but so right, so we're kind of from an LSU perspective, definitely down. But the saving grace was, <laughs> I'll have breaking news: LSU baseball season. There you go. So we're huge fans. Always have been. Right. So, and LSU has pretty good history when it comes to baseball. I mean, when we were kids, I think it's the first game that, that uh, I ever attended was an LSU baseball game. Yeah. We went down there to the old box. Yeah. Yeah. That was back when you, that was before Jesus for Al. So <laughs> most of the memories of that trip, <laughs> the things that I've tried to forget. Well, thanks for bringing that up. The baseball <laughs> kind of hooked me in. <laughs> And you've kind of had a long history because you and Maneri are pretty good pals. We we so are. You yeah. actually did a lot of you threw out the first pitch. I mean, you've had some like connections. It's so weird everywhere. You I... and I have been to a couple of World Series together. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't. The one time I went not with you is when LSU won. The other two times yeah, we word didn't word, word travel fast. Uh, we just got the word. I was turning back to Jesus. <laughs> so I said, "All right." So I'm sitting there. He pulled up out there. He said, "He said, well, how's it going?" I said, "We have the fattened catfish. We're going to celebrate because the lost son had come." Story of yeah. the Luke fifteen, yeah. No, you that, swerved us into that one, Jay. But I noticed what we do, even on the podcast. Uh, we have a guest today who I was I became familiar with when he played football for LSU because I I keep up with all that. Oh yeah. And I think it's more people are like, they always say, well, what's the big deal? We live in Louisiana. I mean, everything about Louisiana, we're we're pretty much bought into. So, That's right. You know, and we were all athletes way back in the day. That is no longer uh, a thing. <laughs> no, so I think that ship that, sailed a long that, time. That, that's what happens in your athletic career. You go play all these sports and you think about, boy, I wonder if I'm ever going to be good enough to – you know, play college ball, and no, that was the answer, the short answer. But then you just kind of evolve to where you become a sports fan. That's right. And I've always liked the passion of college sports. I, I was hoping this, the new NIL thing where now they're getting money, I hope it doesn't change mm. the the passion about that. Because what I don't like about pro sports is that. Yeah. It's just like they're just, it's a business. The job, they're doing it, yeah. and then – and you kind of lose that passion, but but I do think they should be getting paid. I do too, because the universities and they're making tens of millions of dollars. In some case, that. SEC billions with a B. So yeah, I just I, my thinking it was I wish they would have set it aside for those guys, and then they got it when they got through with the college experience. Some some way to keep that because you're right. I, I'm afraid we're going to lose that. Already with the switching teams every other year. Well, you got to figure out some kind of cap system, or this yeah. is just going to get crazy. It's going to get mean, wild, wild yeah. west. Yeah. Today so. we will be listening to one of our brothers tell his story, and it's quite the story. Uh, I have a three quarter inch thick aluminum boat. I had the Cajuns build it for me, and. Uh, one of one of somebody's dogs, old Daniel Edwards, his he had his dog with him, and when the dog ran forward in the boat, he he pushed down on the safety, safety. yeah, and as his claw caught claw by, boom, it the shot went off, and right now to this day there's a hole in the front of my boat where you sit, but then it's, you know, you got a little wall there where you little stash stuff, but there's a hole right there, a round hole. It had enough power to go through the aluminum, that thick aluminum. It went through that, but then just 
bounced around a little bit. No one hurt. But we have a story coming from our, oh, ma'am. Yeah, very, our brothers right now. You know, that Well, and, and really, you know, what we're about is Jesus. And we've been in Luke and we've been in Acts. And, and you notice when Jesus was going around, he just had a compassion for people that were going through difficulty or tragedy or illnesses or yep. all kind of thing, physical ailments, yep. which showed you the character of God in, in some light because it showed you that he cared. Yep. But he also would use that as when we all go through tragedy or difficulty, whether it's us or our family, or even if it's by our own doing, because Jesus, with equal enthusiasm, people that were, uh, you remember the woman caught in adultery, and, you know, he, he, because they were wanting to stone her. And he, here he goes, you know, shows her love and compassion and, and really set a precedent when he said that statement, you, without sin, throw the first stone. And he did eventually say, neither do I con- condemn you, now go leave your life of sin. Which and all these things were signs to that shows you when bad things happen, it affects us, our, our spirit, and it humbles us. It makes us realize, you know, we're perishable. Yeah. And well, here's Jesus. He has all the answers to all these problems, tragedies, and it may not be in the short term because he does say, you know, if you follow me, you will suffer. And most of the writers of this New Testament that we've been studying died horrible deaths in the name of Jesus. Right. I mean, they were tortured, persecuted, and beaten because of Jesus. But there's a power in there to know that the reason we put our faith and trust in Jesus is because in the end, and even in the short time as far as our attitude and how we handle it, there's hope. But in the end, you know, we're going to win. The, things will be made right. That's and exactly so, right. It's kind of how you wrap your head around when bad things happen, which is used as an excuse in the world for why they don't follow God or put their faith and trust in them. And Jesus, basically, that was his platform. Yeah. I, I get it. Bad things happen, but I'm here. That's right. Well, and today uh, we've got one of those stories uh, that's here with us is going to share his story. And look, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I skim and read a lot of books for guests that come on. Uh, and I'll say this before we bring our guest on. When I started into his book, he and his wife, uh, I didn't skim it. I read it word for word. It compelled me. It's one of the most uh, alluring, inspiring books I've read in a long, to- long, long time. So we're going to take a break. When we do, uh, I'll introduce our guest that we have here today. So obviously we talk a lot uh, on the podcast uh from our own personal lives and our experiences about why we're so heavily involved in the pro-life movement and the pro-life movement is very, there's a lot of facets to it. I mean, there's all, there's of course that decision that's made uh, at the very beginning, but then there are things that go because we we're pro-life for all of life, right? We want to teach people. Zach, you guys kind of have a, you guys have plugged in in a unique way. So tell us a little bit about that. I work pro-life because my, my daughter would not be here if you know if she had been aborted in the womb and she has been such a blessing to our family my wife also sits on the board of a children's home here locally in black mountain so yeah we i mean we really truly want to embody not just preventing abortions but also orphan care you know james 127 says pure religion is to is to look look after widows and orphans in their distress and keep oneself being from being polluted by the world. So that's, I mean, we're, we want to be all in with that. Yeah. And as we sit here today, I mean, the lives of baby babies still in the womb, I mean, it literally hangs in the balance. Right. And so one of our sponsors is a group called preborn and uh, we love what they're doing. They're empowering young expectant mothers in crisis to choose life. And let's face it. I mean, these are, all these are young teenage, uh, young women, and it's it's hanging there in the balance. And so preborn has rescued hundreds of thousands of babies through ultrasound because we know how powerful it is when you can hear the baby's heartbeat. Uh, that's that divine encounter of knowing that there's a life there and your choice is so crucial. And so uh, we love working with these guys. They're working to save babies and save lives. Preborn has a passion to save unborn babies from abortion 
and they see women come to Christ many times over this experience. Over the past 15 years, preborn centers have counseled over 450,000 women considering abortion, and over 200,000 babies have been saved. And we praise God for that. Amazing numbers, a lot more to do. Uh, we want you to help rescue some of these babies as well. To do that, you donate by dialing pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby. Or you can go to preborn.com slash unashamed. That's preborn.com slash unashamed. Welcome back to Unashamed, uh, and we've got Matt Branch on set with us. Welcome, Matt, to the Unashamed podcast. Into the layers, we say. Yeah, thank y'all for having me here today. Oh man! And, and so, are you from Starlington? No, I'm from oh. I'm from Ravel. Like I'm a I'm a local redneck, like y'all are, and I can truly appreciate the setup y'all have here. I was admiring how clean it is out there. Wow! Like our <laughs> our shit is Should like is, it, a, a it is a mess. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what ours looks like now. Like it's well, when it's I walked out to get mad, he was like looking around. I knew you would love this because yeah. I read your book. Which, by the way, whoever got my email or leaked it, I got like ten ways to. HVAC. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got, because we talked about this problem of bringing the mud in, which most of the emails I got were basically like, why don't you just wash it off before you go in there? Which we okay. talked about that. But it's not practical in the moment. You go duck hunting, you shoot some ducks. It's like, you just pull in here and the mud. You're in a hurry. Right. You know, yeah, right. Got, We're trying to get somewhere, somewhere else. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we yeah. talked about some sort of car wash scenario, but oh, I've got a bunch too. I mean, there's a lot of spiritual applications here. If you keep <laughs> bringing the dirt into the house after a while, the whole thing is muddy. Yeah. Well, it was affecting trying... our ability to shoot our podcast because there was so much dust in here on the equipment. So I was like, Something has to be done. So the guys have been doing a pretty good job. We appreciate all the response stuff. We'll take the best maybe and revisit that. That's right. How to clean up the layer. It's clean on my standards. So, so Matt is a, is a Louisiana boy, as we said. Uh, grew up hunting uh, and fishing, I guess. Uh, a little bit east of us. And he's written a, a book. And this is, this is the book right here. Uh, Nobody's Gonna Die Today is the name of it. And you see him, he's got his LSU uni on. And so we knew about your story way back when. And you told us when you came in, and I had forgotten this, that about four years ago you met Dad. Mm -hmm. And so our one of our landowners that's right here next to us is George Franklin, who's who's awaiting the resurrection now, but his family still owns the land out here. And you're also a family friend of the Franklins. And so he brought you down here to meet Dad. And I remember it now. We actually mentioned it on the podcast. We had just started the podcast when that happened. And yep. you said you, a couple of people even had said, oh, I heard about you on the Unashamed podcast. Yeah, so it was it was a crazy deal. So I was uh, just sitting at the house one day. I get an email from a guy. He said, hey, you want to be on my podcast? And I was like, yeah, sure. Tell me about it. And he said, well, I, I heard about your story on the Unashamed podcast. And I was like, when did those guys talk about me? Like, what what they say about me? You know, I was kind of nervous. I was like, man, maybe they're talking bad about me. But um, so anyway, I was uh sitting in my truck one day. I was eating some Podna's barbecue. I actually kind of write about this in the book. And um, I was eating Podna's barbecue and sitting in my truck off 165 and listening to y'all's podcast, trying to figure out, you know, what y'all said about me. Mm. And I'm just sitting there listening to what y'all are saying and waiting on y'all to call my name. And something just came over me and I heard like God's voice, like he called my name in that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, y'all were playing in the background, but I, God came through loud and clear. Yeah. And like, I started to get the shakes. I didn't know what was going on. Pulled back on the highway, drove to my house, crutched into my office, sat down and I started typing. And I typed that book right there in four days. Wow. Four days, just nonstop. My wife thought I'd lost it or something. I was like, I, I, something's just coming out of me. I've got to get it out. I've got to get it on paper. Yeah. Typed it in four days and then sat on it for about three years. And <laughs> I was like, this thing's no good. Like, I, I don't trust myself. You know, it's no good. And eventually it, it just start, kept eating at me. Like, I got to do something with it. Just if one person buys it or thousands by it like i don't care i've just got to put it out yeah and um and i did and 
you know, now here I am today to talk about it. That's so amazing. It's, uh, and, it's pretty and, cool. Y'all are a part of that that story right there. I did not know that yeah. until you said that. So I got to say something about the book. So like I said, I you know, I read a lot of books because of guests on the podcast. And most time I don't have time. It's usually like a few days out. But so I picked this one up. And I said, I'm going to read this on my trip because we had a couple of appearances. So I was going to had a lot of plane rides. Well, I wound up doing it in one plane ride. Well, actually two uh, to South Carolina. It, it was riveting. I mean, it's it's well done. Mm-hmm. And I love it that you did it with your wife. And so I'm going to let you tell your story. But I, I love the back and forth and her giving her perspective when you were going through all this. And so just as a person who's done a lot of books with our family, uh, I was riveted. From mm-hmm. start to finish. It's, it's an amazing story. It's a God story. You tell the story about the potters, but I didn't know that we were playing in the background. That's pretty cool that we were a part of that. Yeah. So yeah. And I haven't, I haven't told a bunch of people that, but, but now y'all know. So that's awesome. You know, the work y'all do here and in the back of the shop, man, it's, <laughs> it's reach, it's doing a lot. Every, it's doing a lot out there. You everybody know? always points that out because they show up thinking, well, this can't be the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but back beyond all the filth and the duck stuff, there's a little studio. There. There's a little studio. Well, my favorite question to most people on the podcast is, what do you think when you walked in there? But you were one I knew that would appreciate walking through what you yep. did to get here. Anywhere, uh, when I step out of the truck, I got to make sure I'm not going to step on a snake or something, you know? Like, I yeah. feel at home there. Yeah. And, well, like, snakes don't scare me as bad. I got one less target for them to hit, so it's like, <laughs> it's not as big of a threat anymore. We've had cotton mouths end up in here who had to ride in here and cotton mouths are here so it's best to take a look <laughs> yeah oh yeah so matt reminds me of our old buddy triple j uh, johnny joey jones he'd lost both of his legs mm. in afghanistan but he's always joking making jokes like you just made all right yeah. so let's let's tell your story because it's 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 fascinating um, and I want people to get the book so you can just give us the overview, but, but tell us what happened to you, um, at, at least up until, you know, the hospital stuff. And I got some questions for you, but, but tell us what happened to you. Yeah. So it was December 28, 2018. It's been about a little over five years ago. Now we were at Eagle Lake, Mississippi, which is just North of Vicksburg, about 30 minutes North of Vicksburg off highway 61. And my family's had a farm over there for shoot probably 20 plus years since I was a kid we've been going over there and deer hunting duck hunting and it's just a normal trip you know we mm-hmm. took a trip over there just about every year right after Christmas and you know went and shot ducks and deer hunted and all that and were y'all hunting like a blind or out of the boat no or? so there's it's like a cypress break oh, okay so we there's like the way we set it up that morning is we were going to hunt in different areas so there was a lot of water on the farm. Um, it had just rained. So we had some new pockets of water and there was some birds and scattered all over in some new new areas and new pockets. And so I was going to go hunt one pocket that we saw some birds in the day before. And I was going to go by myself and hunt because there's a little, just a little bit of natural cover. There wasn't many places to hide. Yeah. So uh, I was headed in that direction and a series of unfortunate events that morning. Um, it was a lot. But anyway, I ended up crashing the four-wheeler, uh, flipping it off a culvert, landed in the about five foot of water in a canal, and um, my plans changed. So I ended up having to walk like half a mile to go meet up with my buddies through the mud and muck and just terrible day, terrible duck hunting experience. Mm. So we get over You're there. wet, cold. I'm wet, cold, yep. yeah, just, just terrible day. Like one of the worst duck hunts you would think, you could think of as what happened to me. So I walk over there to my buddies and we're kind of loading up, you know, our gear, trying to figure out where all the ducks were, you know, because we didn't kill as many as we wanted to. Yeah. So we're trying to regroup and figure out where else we need to go try. And we're loading everything up. And I had laid my shotgun down in the back of a Polaris Ranger. All right. Loading all the gear, decoys. I had stuck a Mojo decoy in the side and the little holes on the side. You yep. can kind of stick the pole in it. Mm-hmm. I was standing right there on the passenger side of the um, Polaris Ranger. We had a hunting dog with us, a black Labrador retriever. His name was Tito. It was my cousin's dog, actually. And um, we had sent him after a duck to try to go find. It was a blind retrieve out in the middle of the field. He couldn't find it, came running back, and we were all just kind of standing around waiting on the dog to get back to us. And when he did, he jumped up in the bed of the Ranger and, it's kind of moving around for a minute, 
trying to find a spot to sit, you know, in all the mm-hmm. gear. Then all of a sudden we hear a loud bang, just a crack. It's kind of muffled. Didn't sound like a, a blast, you know, because it was in the bed. Yeah. Well, the dog had stepped on my shotgun. The shotgun went off. The bullet went through the sidewall of the ranger and hit me in the top of my left thigh and groin. Hmm. Just like that. And I remember I looked down. I saw about a Coke can size hole in the ranger bed and it didn't look real good, you know. And yeah. But the weird thing, like I didn't feel any pain or nothing like that. Like it didn't, I didn't think it was that bad at first. Yeah. So I kind of went to take a step back to see the damage and see how bad I was hit. And when I did, my left leg didn't move, tripped, fell to the ground. And then that's when the adrenaline rush just ran over me like a freight train. Like every hunter's worst nightmare became my reality, just like in a split second. Yeah. So I screamed out, you know, I've been shot and um, I couldn't move. Like my blood pressure dropped immediately. My femoral artery was hit by the blast. The, The surgeons later on, they told us my femoral artery looked like hamburger meat. It was just... Gone, obliterated. That's amazing. You didn't just bleed to death right there. Well, oh, man. <laughs> some of it was because I fell in the water that morning, so yep. my blood vessels has contracted. I was freezing cold, probably on the verge of hypothermia. Yeah. So that's kind of a one of the strange things that happened that allowed me to sit here today and tear my story. But um, so the guys they picked me up, loaded me in the Ranger, called nine one one, and they sped off through the farm to the highway they decided to take me to the highway instead of back to our camp which where we were on the farm that day it's about the same distance to both places you know usually you would think let's go to the camp we might have first aid kit you know some supplies we can help him out but they just said no we're going to the highway well getting me to the highway got me to the hospital probably 15 20 minutes faster for the you know ambulance to get to me quicker saved your life saved my life because every second counted yep you know in that moment so i pull up to the high, we pull up to the highway and they pull me out, lay me on the side of the road. And uh, first responders get there. They were volunteer firefighters from Eagle Lake. They came up to me and they started to cut my waders off. And that's when everybody realized like how serious the situation was. They said when they cut my waders off, and um, sorry for the details here, but they said blood just poured out of my boot like water from a pitcher, like you would be pouring water out of this water bottle. Mm. And they said my clothes were just stained red from the chest down. Basically, I had bled out at that point. Like, I didn't have any blood left in my body. And um, they loaded the ambulance showed up. They loaded me up in the ambulance, speeding off down the road. And I just kind of faintly remember, you know, drifting side to side in the curves and gone. Mm. Just blackness. Just gone. And... um You know, I I experienced death. That's when I went into cardiac arrest that day. Uh, They said later on, the doctors told us, they estimated I was in cardiac arrest for somewhere around 45 minutes total. Mm. Um, So by human standards, I should not be here. Yeah. You know, should not be here. And, you know, experiencing death is, is something, I mean, obviously you would think it would change your life, but it has just shaken my world because it was then and there that, Laying on the side of the highway, I saw the truth of my life. Yeah. What I stood for, what I cared about the most. I saw the truth. And that day, you know, I was not proud yeah. of what I saw. Yeah. You know, I was, I cared only about myself, you know, and having experienced that and lived through it, it's just, it's changed me in so many ways, you know, yeah. it has. Yeah. But. It's powerful. It's, uh, let's take a break. So you wind up uh, in the hospital. And again, I know the story intimately because I just read it. Um, 12 days, you're in a coma. They're, they're doing surgeries. They're, you know, this In the book, this is where his wife steps in, where, where Matt just left off. He loses consciousness, and then the story picks up from her perspective, which I thought was a great way to tell it, because now she's, like, reacting to it. And you had an infant. Your son was an infant. Yeah, Barrett. He was one years old. One years old. And so now you're getting it from a – his wife's perspective on, you know, and she's getting all the bad news because everything is like he's coding. 
They're having to move him to another bigger hospital because there was nothing else they could do for him in Vicksburg. That's where he started. Mm -hmm. So he winds up in Jackson, larger hospital. But, I mean, literally, this thing is on a razor's edge. Like like he said, he should have been dead by any other standard. I mean, this it, it, we talk about miracles a lot in the idea of what's a miracle, what's not. Mm -hmm. This is as close you're going to get to a guy that, that should have died and then should have had brain damage. I mean, because of the loss of blood, the whole thing. So you're in a coma for 12 days. Here's here's the first thing I want to ask you about, because this struck me in the book. This You got me in the prologue, by the way, because you mentioned <laughs> about these dreams mm -hmm. that you had in this coma state. And so I we, we've been talking a lot about this idea of, you know, what people's experiences and spiritual warfare and a lot of this stuff lately, because we just studied the book of Luke. And I thought it was fascinating, some of the things like you, you, there was an awareness in your mind, but but you were unaware because you're in a coma. So you don't really know what's happening in the world around you. But tell a little bit about that. Just you're not going into it, but I'm just saying to how that impacted you and affected you. And why do you think that was? Because your wife also mentions during this 12-day period that she had a couple of instances where she felt like there was a spiritual, like there was almost a tug of war for you, mm -hmm. for your soul, for all of it. So I, I just found that whole thing fascinating. So give get a little of your perspective. Yeah, it was a uh, it was such a strange thing. So for me, I was in a coma. I was out of it, right? So I'm having these vivid dreams, and when I say vivid, like I have dreams every night, but these dreams, I remember them like they were a part of my life. It was, mm. it was. Similar to the world we live in today, it was just a little bit more chaotic. Like it was just crazy things happening all the time. It was strange. And I can't get into talking about all that. I've, I've actually thought about writing a book about some of the dreams I had, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so I'm sitting there having these crazy dreams. And then my wife is in the hospital. And then they were letting her stay in my room in the ICU, which is usually not allowed. But they let her do it just because of the gravity of the situation. And and she had these crazy experiences. Like one night she remembered uh, she was asleep. And she was woken up by all my machines. Monitors were just beeping, just going crazy. And she said the nurses and doctors, they started to come in and they were all like concerned, like didn't know what was happening. And she said she just was sitting there and experienced like only way she could describe it was just a dark like presence, like just came in and just sucked all the air out of the room and she said right then she there was like a little have y'all seen those little handheld olive wooden crosses they're kind yeah. of misshaped but you yeah. can hold them with your hand she there was one on the table beside her she grabbed it and just started praying and she said as soon as she started praying that that darkness whatever it was just kind of dissipated mm. and my monitors just stopped they just boop just stopped and the doctors were like he's he's good okay we got another day with him. We got another day with him, you know. And so that was one crazy instance. But, yeah, when I woke up, so I was living another life in these dreams. And I woke up, and I thought they were real, like they actually happened. Uh, one of the dreams, sorry to say this, but uh, I was at a, a big hunting lodge somewhere, right? We were on a big bird hunt. And um, the guy that owned it, rumored was he was worth, like, a lot of money. And uh, in my dream, all right, he had asked me to marry his daughter in the dream. And I was like thinking about it in my dream. I was like, I don't know. He's got a nice hunting lodge, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I don't know, he's got a bunch of stuff. And when so when I woke up, I was thinking that really happened. And I was like scared, like Leanna was going to slap me or something, you know, like, cause yeah. I was like, I thought I just showed up for the day to have a little procedure, you know? Yeah. But it took my family weeks to convince me like, no, you were, you were dreaming that whole time. Like you were, yeah. you were here physically, but you, in a, and mentally you were in a whole nother world, like living another life. It was crazy. And it's crazy to imagine somebody yes. being in a, in a, this state for days and days. Yeah. Well, it's almost like to me from, from reading the book, Matt, it was like you were almost caught in between, like you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're not in the, you were here, but you weren't here. There's a lot going on here. That's why it intrigued me about the spiritual warfare side of it, because it was almost like it was this whole thing. It was all coming down. But this was almost over two weeks. Yep. Your wife is experiencing it as it she said. It seems like it was your soul. It was like a battle, yeah. I have a TV show about 
experiences like that. Yeah, uh, I forget. It's like I survived yeah. or something. And they basically tell their dreams. I'm surprised they haven't contacted you. Because people, it's a fascinating it is. thing because we're all have that coming one day. Yeah. Uh, like it or not. So then you, you when you came out of the coma, this, this is another thing I found interesting in the book. Then you were hallucinating because of the drugs you're on mm-hmm. that are basically keeping you going, and and so you can stand it because now you've you've lost your leg. First, it was so your leg is gone at this time. Yeah, so well, they, yeah. So, I, so I was my wife. That. So she had to make the decision the first night to oh, amputate yeah. my leg. Yeah, no, she had to do it by herself. You know, in a room of like fifty people, family and friends, and That's a tough doctors spot. come out and they say, "Hey, we need to amputate his leg." If we don't, he's probably not going to make it. What do you want to do? And so she's got to sit there and make this decision without me. Yeah, I can't. She can't ask me what I want. You know. Yeah, you're out. Yeah. So she it was gone the first night, and um, so I woke up, and yeah, I was trying to figure out what was going on because I was hallucinating, like you said, yeah. really bad. Right. I had just I had been medicated so heavily with all the surgeries I went through. They had given me three hundred units of blood. So I had 300 units of blood, which roughly, and I might get corrected by a medical professional listening, but it's like every drop of blood in about 30 to 35 people, something like that. Mm. That's how much blood they had to give me to keep me, Ooh. keep me going. It's a crazy story. And I think you I think you said that as far as anybody knows, that's the most anybody's ever had. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Right, exactly. I don't know if it's a record. Or what. It's a lot. It was a I record. Of your, your same situation. I, I must admit, God becomes real. Yes. More real than in any other time in your life. Yes. Because you, here you sit. You say, the Almighty intervened on your behalf, my man. I was utterly powerless. I had no yeah. control of the outcome. I was. It was taken. I was I was completely reliant on God and and His will for my life. When did it all start? And still today, fade into. Did you do when you finally came to and they finally got it under control, and you the leg is gone. But how long did it take for you to say, Lord, thanks for that because that's right. You were right on the edge. Mm-hmm. Actually, past the edge. But but Matt, one of the things that struck me was that I loved your honesty and transparency in the book because once you realize your leg is gone, like any other person, your part of your struggle back and forth was why did this happen? You went back and replayed the day. I mean, like all those things began to come to the forefront, right? Mm-hmm. Because now it's like I've got to live this way, and what am I going to do from here? And and you struggle with it. I mean, like there was a real struggle inside of you. And, mm-hmm. and part of the reason you planted LSU, I found this fascinating because you talked about how that some of the things you wish you had done differently, some of the things you wish you had pushed yourself into back when you were a college athlete also became part of your motivation to do what you've done in the since that time. So talk a little bit about that, just kind of how that experience affected you and, and all that. Yeah, so – that's that's the reason I wear my LSU jersey. you realize I made it? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the reason I wear the LSU jersey on the cover. I mean, it doesn't have much to do with what happened that day, but it has a lot to do with how I responded exactly. to what I was put in, the circumstance I had to live with going forward. But, yeah, so so right away, you know, the medication and everything, it kind of clouds your mind. Like, I was just glad to be alive. I was joking around a lot, you know, mm-hmm. cracking on the nurses, this and that. And then, but over time, probably about two weeks, when I got transported or transferred to that main hospital out of ICU, that's when the realization of like, okay, this is my life now. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm, I'm missing my entire left leg. You know, I'm amputated at the hip, which is called a hip disarticulation amputation, which um, is quite the mouthful and kind of hard to remember. But the nickname for it is actually hippie. So uh, oh, wow. whether I like it or not, I'm a hippie for life. <laughs> which I think that's far out. You know, I dig it. But, well, um, it, it helps because you're alive and can speak of your it, well. Most your, people your troubles. Most if you, people, look, if you can't laugh with it, you can't lift with it. You know, that's kind of what I always say. So, um, and most people wind up in a wheelchair. Yes, with this, by the way. So let's let's take another break. Yeah, 
Yeah, so so talk about that. You were in the rehab, and you you're in this process of figuring it out, and you went through a lot during this process. You know, you and God, and yep. you and your family, and everything. Yeah, wrestling is is what I call it. Yep. You know, wrestling with God, just on why me, mm. you know, why not anybody else? What did I do that was so wrong? You know, and at that point in my life, I was I was raised right here in Northeast Louisiana. I went to church every Sunday, and but. I can honestly tell you at that point in my life, I didn't know who Jesus was. And Jesus definitely didn't know me. You know, I didn't have a personal relationship with him. I may have spoken the words, the salvation prayer, but they never entered in my heart where it matters. And um, it took some time for all of that to come about. But immediately in the hospital, you know, I was just torn apart. You know, I I was concerned about my life, but it was more my, my son's life, my wife, you know, what what was their experience going to be now with mm. with me being literally half the man I was before? And, you know, how is it going to affect them moving forward? And I just kept fighting it, kept wrestling with it. And, I mean, what happens when you wrestle with somebody? You know, you come in pretty close contact with them. And here I am wrestling with God. And it ended up coming in close contact with him. But I had a a therapist came by my room one day, and this was part of the treatment there at the hospital. And I was given, letting her have it, you know, about why this, why me, you know, why has this got to be my life now? And she looked at me and she said, well, don't you think it's better that your son has a dad than not have a dad at all? Wow. And right then, those words just just pierced me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, here I am sitting here mad and aggravated, but I've still got a chance to be a dad. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. And that from that moment on just set me on a trajectory and that's where my LSU um, career kind of plays in. So my LSU career was nothing special, right? I was what most would consider a um, less than average career at LSU. You know, I was a scholarship player. I played in 28 games. I never started on offense. I played an offensive lineman and um, you know, and it ate me alive when I, I ended up deciding to uh, forego my last year due to having too many concussions. I quit. Mm -hmm. And at the time, a young 22, 23-year-old self, I was like, well, it's going to be easier for me to tell people, you know, injuries took my career from me than me just not ever panning out. I thought that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you live with that for a while, and then it just began to eat me alive, you know, like, gosh – I could have been so much better. I could have tried harder, you know. Even if my career playing time would have never changed, if I would have just gave it my best effort, I could live with that. But I knew deep down, like, I didn't give it my best. I cut corners, you know, all that. And having experienced that with an LSU career and knowing how deep that hurt was, that's when it kind of pulled out of me like, okay, I'm faced with the same challenge right here. Like yeah. I can start cutting corners right here in the hospital and I'll never be as good as I could have been with this disability that I have to live with. Or I can give it my best effort from this day forward and see what happens. And that's what I chose right then and there. I was like, I'm not going to repeat the past. Mm. I'm going to do my best to work as hard as possible to do as much and gain as much mobility back as I can with this disability, you know. But well, now you're hooked on to the power source. Yes. Of you get another leg. Yeah. Yeah, and that's you know what what better hope does uh anybody out there who's gone through an amputation have of ever walking again? What better hope, you know? And there's um, no hope. There's that. no hope than that. <laughs> that's it, you know. But uh yeah, it's it's just truly a a crazy story, you know. And then I ended up, you know, working really hard. I lost 110 pounds um, total, which I got to admit, some of that was my leg. So that came off pretty quick. <laughs> um, but it is a good weight loss plan. I haven't got anybody signed up for it yet. You know, you can just cut it off if you want. Yeah, but, I don't uh, think you, <laughs> yeah, so, you, won't, you, won't, you won't have the privilege of that's cutting it. <laughs> real thin it doesn't come back you know no. you don't gain that one back so so you talked about um this like trying to figure that out 
you got home and your son, you mentioned that the first thing he started doing was like knocking your uh, knocking your crutch out from yeah. or haul, running away with it, right? So how did yeah. he react to all that? Kind of just watching him because he sounds like a, I get some one of these days I got to meet him because he sounds like a very interesting uh, boy. He's a character, that's for sure. But yeah, I mean, it didn't phase him a bit. Yeah, you know? I mean that's what gets me right. Kids, it's like I mean. The, that person who told you that was so right on because, like, he had his yep. dad back, you yep. know. And really, I guess, other than you not being around, he was so young, He, he all he knows is you. Mm-hmm. And so all those struggles you went through internally wound up being – playing themselves out and you being his dad. And, and now you being you, I mean, it's, he'll, he'll get that chance to have, the you know, his life with you. Yep. Which is incredible. Oh, I know. You know, it's uh... – you know, now they, they see me and they ask me questions all the time. They're like, uh, what's, where's your leg? I'm like, it's in the bedroom back there. You know, I don't have it on right now. They're like, oh, okay, cool. Doesn't bother them, you know. And they pick, he even, like, Barrett will even pick on me now. He always brags about how how he's faster than me. I'm like, dude, I'm like, that's not like saying much. You know, you're faster than a one-legged guy. But one day he'll he'll realize, like, how dumb it was to say that. So, <laughs> But yeah, no, it doesn't. It hadn't affected my kids at all. You know what would affect them more is if I would just not be around. You, you know, and and not not give them my best effort that I'm capable of today. You know, and that's that's what I've tried to do through all this. You know, but from the what happened to your leg, is it painful now or is it? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you yep. So um, phantom pain. I don't know if y'all have ever heard that term, but it's uh it's something that all amputees. Um, encounter so it's the sensation that my leg is still there like I can still feel it like right now I feel like I'm wiggling my toes on my left leg like still wiggling my foot around but every now and then like most of the time for me I'm, I'm very fortunate it's more of a sensation like I just feel it but every now and then it'll flare up and it, it feels like somebody is either electrocuting me just like for a quick second, and then they'll pull it off like a cattle prod or like either somebody stabbing me with a knife in my foot. And every now and then it happens, which I'm, I'm fortunate it's not frequent for me, but for some amputees out there, like it is a constant feeling of that, which is That's very, right. very difficult. Um, for most people, it gets better with time. You know, it just takes your brain some time to kind of re-register like the nerve endings down there that nothing's there, you know, that yeah. this is normal now. And your brain's fighting that that and um and wanting to like say you know stress like there's something wrong there's something wrong but could they get an apparatus from what you've seen so far because uh, the medical profession is getting a lot better Mm -hmm. in this type thing uh so tell the story about the guy so the guy you that did your leg for you is actually from chicago Mm -hmm. tell how that happened because that was pretty amazing that you happened upon that guy yeah that was another Another crazy instance. So my story, whenever whenever this happened, it went pretty pretty much nationwide. Like a lot of news news outlets picked it up. I think ESPN picked it up, and the title was "LSU football player shot by dog." And immediately, like yeah. you see that, you're like, I'm clicking on that story. Like, what happened? You know, <laughs> yeah. which is kind guy. of a travesty. That yeah. They they thought, oh, that's a cool. That's well, a it's, way. it's a clickbait yeah. story, right? It's clickbait yeah. for yeah. sure. But it ended up, you know, helping me right. in, in a lot of ways. But yeah, so so the guy that um that ended up building my prosthetic, an LSU, uh, a big LSU fan who had a non In other words, you, now you have an apparatus. Mm-hmm. For, uh, yeah, I have one. This is the guy I have that one built. that I use. Well, that and, had to um, have been good. Oh yeah, it's very helpful. It's still, it's not a leg by any means, but it's uh, it's better than nothing. You know, it yeah. gives me the ability to use my hands and a little bit more bit mobility and and kind of freedom for doing certain things. But um, so a guy, uh, LSU fan who had a nonprofit, he reached out to my dad and he said, "Hey, I adopted a a boy from India." And he was in an accident when he was very young, lost both of his feet. And we've had to, you know, deal with prosthetics for him for a long time. I know a guy who specializes in the amputation that your son has. And he was telling my dad this. And um, he said, look, I'll, I'll pay to fly him down to visit with, with your son, with me, in the hospital if y'all are okay with it. And dad was like, yeah, sure, why not, you know. So uh, David Rodgers' his name, he, he's in Chicago, just south of Chicago, Illinois, is where his practice is. He flew into Jackson and met with me, and 
sat me down and just kind of just spelled it out for me. Like, this is not going to be easy. You know, like I was in bad shape when he visited me the first time I was still in the hospital. And he said, you're going to have to work really hard if you want to walk again. Hmm. And, um, and so I, you know, that's kind of what I set out to do. He really motivated me. And then we've had, we have a great relationship still to this day. I go up to Chicago once or twice a year to, you know, get him to tweak it and work on it and try to make it a little bit better. But, um, yeah, so it's, it's a pretty cool thing. You know, that clickbait title that felt bad in the, at first, you know, that felt yeah. embarrassing to me yeah. ended up being a way for, for God to, uh, mm. be able to come into my life and, and help me to you know, move forward and progress and everything. And, and even you telling about learning how to walk on it. I mean, again, this is, it's all in the book. It's, it's so fascinating. So you've gotten into, uh, you've lost a lot of weight. I mean, not just your leg, but obviously you got, yep. you got yourself in shape because there's pictures in here of you, like when you're right after your playing days, you're a big old boy. Yeah. I was probably I mean, about 280, 280 the day I got yeah, shot. I yeah, know. I was a big dude. Oh, wow. And, yeah. uh, so it's, it's, it's seeing you now is so different. So, but you, now you run. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, tell a little bit about that, which is amazing. It's hard to imagine. I would uh, just watching you do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, getting back into uh, exercise and fitness, diet, all that, like I had all this knowledge from my football playing days. And so I kind of started to pull it all back out and, and kind of figure out what kind of training I could do, you know, with my new circumstance. And eventually I, I just kind of started to See if I could run some races. You know, crutch is how I do it. Just like I can run. Just like I have a so I have a running leg that I use, a running apparatus, but it's it's really best for just sprinting. It's not good for long distances. So if long distances, I just use my crutches the way I came in here today. So that's how I do my races. And um, so I started doing that, just seeing if I could finish a 5K. And I was like, just see if I can do one. Mm. So I'm out running around my neighborhood or crutching around my neighborhood. And it was funny. I was training for a race and, you know, people would pull up beside me and they'd roll their window down. They'd say, Hey, are are you okay? You want to ride, man? (laughs) They felt bad for (laughs) you. They were like, what is this guy doing out here? Like, surely something's wrong, you know? They think you must be in a hurry. Yeah, he's trying to get somewhere. He's like chasing me or something. (laughs) But uh, they they just look shocked. And I look at them, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm exercising. And they're like, Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Then they, I, I can just imagine them pulling off and me like, man, I got to start exercising. You know, like, <laughs> That's this exactly what they said. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. But then, so yeah, I started doing some like 5K races and I had a lot of fun. You know, people are, there's a lot of people there and people supporting and showing up. And, you know, I started running the races and I get started getting better and I was beating, you know, most people with two legs. And that's another thing I imagine like, what are they thinking when I pass them up in a race, you know? (laughs) They're thinking this is embarrassing, (laughs) embarrassing. which is what we all go through. When you were talking about that, it made me think, It's kind of odd that a lot of people would look and say, I need to be like him. That's right. I need to be more like that guy. (laughs) Well, when you were sharing your story, especially with LSU, uh, you know, I thought about that passage in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, which is a totally different context, but he kind of brings up this idea about regrets and how sorrow Mm -hmm. brings that out. And uh, it says godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And I just thought about it in that because we all can look at our lives. uh, You know, when when my daughter was born with health problems, you know, she had a Mm -hmm. craniofacial issue. I spent three months doing exactly what you did, and this didn't even have anything to do with me, but I was like, why in the world did this happen? Not fair. Where, you know, this is not fair. And, and I had one of the similar moments you had with someone else saying, well, she's alive. Yeah. And it's like, what am I doing here? You know, I'm, I have a daughter. I got a responsibility. I'm going to have to step up. But I think, you know, that's what stood out to me is this, this tragedy and an accident uh, you know, made you look at your life and start regretting a lot of things. A lot. And uh, so I, I just wanted to highlight that in that it makes you realize that there's a God and, and we're not him. Yep. And I think that's the, the foundation for having godly sorrow 
you know let's mm-hmm. he, he's he's look what he's done he saved me he you know because your story is pretty incredible on how you're even here but i just want to point point that out maybe are you using any of those kind of principles in trying to help others because i know you speak a lot which is mm-hmm. what i was trying to get yep to. yeah so that's uh you know if he doesn't do anything else he's done enough you know, for me. And that's, that's what I try to remind myself, but, you know, getting back into the fitness and working out, you know, I thought I was strong enough to do it all on my own at -hmm. first. Like I thought like I can do it, but you know, first Samuel two nine says, but no man will succeed with strength alone. Yeah. Hmm. Somebody had it figured out a long time before I did. (laughs) That's good. Like somebody had it figured out way before I did. But so thinking I could, figure it out, thinking I could handle this, I was strong enough, brought me to the realization that I'm not. Yep. Yeah. I'm not. That's it. You know? So thinking, here we go again. I'm back down into the pit, back down into the darkness of this is the way my life is forever. And I question for a time, I question whether do I really want to live yeah. the rest of my life this way? Do I really want to continue this journey? Because it doesn't look good. But, you know, new life, it always starts in the dark, right? That's it. Yeah. It always starts in the dark. And that's when, um, that's when, you know, God stepped into my life and, and really showed me like, all right, are you, are you tired of, of trying to do it things your way? Like, let's, let's do things my way for a change. Yeah. And, you know, that's where the story we opened with about me starting to sit down and write this book. That's when everything changed for me. Yeah. And, um, you know, all the things that I grew up with as a kid, my, you know, my faith, being in church, all of that, it's like God just smacked me over the head and was like, did you think you had it all figured out? (laughs) Like you thought you had all everything that I've done uh, for creation through all of time figured out already? Because why don't you go back and relook at all this stuff and and revisit it and see if anything sticks out to you? And that's where that's where Jesus just flooded me like with his spirit and I realized then and there like all the regrets all the sorrows all the things that I experienced the day that I thought I was going to die the life that I longed to live that day was the life Jesus lived Mm, yeah and when I saw that I was like man I was like Jesus is the answer that's right right yeah like he is our purpose our purpose is to Walk it out with him. Mm. Pick up our cross and follow him. And then um and then I began to do it. You know, I began to try to live like Jesus and I quickly realized like, man, I'm not Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> like I can't do this. Yeah. And that's when you realize like, man, I'm not very good. I need a savior. And that's when just it all hit me, you know. And yeah. and that's what I share today, you know, when I when I travel and I speak and you know, I've been fortunate to to tell my story many times and, you know, a lot of church settings and I've spoken at schools and banquets and events, uh, even some like corporate events. And, um, you know, it's it's not about me. Yeah. It's about him, because ultimately that's what gave me my life back. When I when I was at the end of my rope, when I thought I could not go any further, God picked me up and said, no, you got a long way to go, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to help you get through it. Yeah. And, um, man, it's just, it's been a crazy ride, crazy ride, but I'm just blessed and fortunate to be able to share my story, you know, quite a lot now. Well, I highly awesome. recommend the book. Nobody's yep. going to die today. Uh, you can get it just anywhere books are sold, right? Yeah. So, so barnesandnoble.com, Amazon, um, those are going to be your, your easiest places. I mean, I did self-publish the book, so, um. Which I, which I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, I was but, like, I was like, man, I, cause I didn't know what to do when I wrote it. Right. I sat on it for three years and I was just like, oh, what? I just kept getting pointed to just put it out, just put it out and see what happens. Let trust me. God was saying, trust me with it. Just trust me. And I put it out. And the first week it went out, I just basically posted it on my Facebook and it hit the Barnes and Noble bestseller list. It was like the number one biography, top ten yeah. overall. And I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, I didn't do a pre-release. I didn't do anything like you're supposed to do. I didn't market it. I didn't put a dollar behind any advertising. Nothing. I just put it on Facebook. Some people bought it. They got it. They read it. They told some more people. They told some more people. And I've sold thousands of it. 
Yeah. Now, and it, most of it's just all right here locally. Yeah, that's you know, it's, it's God's story. So we want you yeah. to check it out. Uh, is there a place if they want to reach out to you about speaking or stuff like that? Do you yeah, have a place? Social media. I've got a few okay. um, accounts on social media. So I'm on Instagram, okay, Facebook. Good. We'll There's, put it, we'll um, put those yeah, up. We'll put that up. Matt Branch uh, is where you find that. Uh, and your wife is amazing too. And you have a little daughter now as yep. well. Yeah, which Charlotte. Is, so. Which is fantastic. So thank you, Matt, for telling your story. Uh, thank you for living. Thank you for hanging in there and not giving up uh, because you inspire a lot of people. Yeah, thank you all very much for having me today. I really appreciate it and thank appreciate you. all the work you all do too, man. It's it's truly remarkable, you know, being from here and, and knowing you all my whole life and just seeing where you all have gone. It's yeah. it's truly crazy. Mr. Phil, I remember you coming to my church and, and preaching a message uh, at a wild game supper, you know, when I was a kid. And you were up there with your Bible and your duck calls, you know. and yep. It means the it's Lord crazy. works in strange ways. Yes. <laughs> strange and mysterious. <laughs> hey, you don't have to tell me that. Look, I never get it. So, well, thank you, Matt. Thank you Appreciate you being there, brother. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.